if it's time. Continuing, I'm consenting. Me too. I don't think we have a choice. <laughs> and um, I have the minutes right in front of me from the last meeting. There's one minor change that I saw in it that didn't the meeting. Uh, not three to three five, but three thirty to five thirty ongoingly. Did anybody else have any other changes? Yeah, I had a couple that I sent to you. I mean, one, one and the second they, section added, just yeah. a clarification. Um, Sharon clarified that Doug and Julie are appointed, and then I added as chair and clerk respectively for one more year. And then um, in the section seven of strategic planning, um, the, and the bullet that begins with Janet. Janet would like to see financing loan programs, blah, blah, blah. Um, so the, to, if the list, list of things to cover include, I just added weatherization to that list. So, can, so the payments on weatherization, heating system or solar, that's the end of that paragraph. That makes sense. And then, and under other items, liaising with cab um, this the bullet that begins with janet it should be janet said that brookline passed a bylaw to ban natural gas in new construction but attorney general laura healy rejected it as inc incompatible with state law Rocky Mountain Institute is working with them to try to change state law. And then the next sentence after that, I didn't really understand. It says cities and towns in Massachusetts interested in building electricity and participate in an accelerator program. And this is the best way to build electrification within the state. So I don't know, it's not what I said, but <laughs> I don't know if somebody else said that, and I'm not hey, sure what you meant. Was you, Kate? Yeah, Julie sent me an email this weekend asking me to clarify that section, and I did. I replied to her with some edits. Okay. I thought that Julie had a copy of the minutes that included your changes, because she had a version of yours that had your initials on it. We're having a little bit of confusion about finishing the minutes because there's too many different versions of it. If you're confused, you can always wait until the next meeting to yeah. approve them, which might be good if yeah. people have different versions. Okay. Yeah, well, I'm, I when I make corrections, I send them to you, Doug, yeah. and I send them to Julie. I don't want to send them to everybody because that will break the open meeting. No, you, you shouldn't. But what we were talking about was the people that are editing the minutes. We could edit the single version in the meeting materials both, and we don't have to give them copies of it. That's what's been going on. Yeah, yeah. I, I just like to type out my corrections to make it easier for Julie. Yeah, whatever works for her. I had a couple of corrections that I haven't sent yet. Okay, why don't you send them to me? And okay. we'll approve this in the next meeting. Okay. So if you want to talk, say what they are, Brad? I, I'm a stickler for spelling, so I'd like the word Hotchkiss to be spelled. Oh, yeah, yes, I did catch that one too. Uh, <laughs> the way it's spelled. And uh, the um, Hate Smart Alliance update 
uh, there were three, there, everything in there was what was updated uh, months ago. Stop, 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 stop. Uh, so I eliminated that update. There wasn't much to report. Uh, one was last month. Okay. The whole thing? Yeah, I think everything was uh, obsolete. It was like a year old or several months old. Uh, okay. So um, is um, somebody going to send out the correct mm -hmm. minutes <coughs> for approval for next time? Is that, is that what somebody's suggesting? Yeah, I was suggesting that we'll have to get on top of sending out the correct version. Uh, send that to... I spent about an hour with Julie about this two days ago, and I thought we had it on all together, but we don't. Mm -hmm. Does anybody know where Julie is? She's in another meeting. She said it was going on for her right now. Okay. Okay, well, let's move right along. Uh, Kate, do you want to talk about your director's report? Sure. So um, last month, there was a request for me to do a director's update. So I sent around um, a written update for you guys to just take a look at. Um, so I won't read through it because um, I don't want to take up too much time, but I'll just highlight a few of the things that I think are particularly exciting. So um, the select board um, recently approved a resolution to opt into the PACE program, which is Property Assessed Clean Energy. Um, this is a, a key step in our Sustainable Concord plan, and basically it allows commercial properties to finance energy improvements through their property taxes. Um, it's a program that's been used in many other states for years, and Massachusetts just launched it this summer, so Concord is now participating um, which is exciting and it's just a great, great resource for commercial buildings to be able to make energy improvements. Um, and the other big thing that I'll highlight is the, um, which was mentioned last time, this Rocky Mountain Institute RMI Building Accelerator Program. So a group of Concord residents and myself are participating in this accelerator program which as um, Janet mentioned is, is kind of a follow on to what happened um, in Brookline this past year. So Brookline passed the bylaw at their town meeting prohibiting new fossil fuel infrastructure and new construction. And the attorney general struck it down because it was not, um, it, it, it preempted the state building code which is not allowed um, in Massachusetts. So RMI's um, brought together some technical expertise and policy expertise to help communities understand what are the legal pathways for promoting building electrification. So Concord is participating in that and they've been taking th us through a process of understanding what our options are. And just last night, um, the Climate Action Advisory Board met and agreed to move forward a resolution to the select board and ask for their signature on that. And it would be a non-binding resolution, which basically says, you know, that this is a problem, right? Like without being able to regulate um, fossil fuel infrastructure in construction, new construction that, you know, Massachusetts won't be able to meet its um, climate goals. So CAB agreed to move that forward to the select board. Um, it's in their meeting packet, a copy of it. I can send you all a link to it. Um, so I'll keep you updated on that, but... Um, <laughs> be great if CSEC maybe at the next meeting wants to discuss, um, you know, supporting that signing on to that resolution. Um, but yeah, I'll stop there and see if you all have any other question, any questions about those things or, or any of the other um, items in the report. I put a bunch of links in there and just some updates on some things that have been happening over the last few months. Before anybody says anything more, um, I'm just wondering, is anybody taking minutes this, today? Oh, you are, Karen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, thank you, Karen. I meant to mention Karen? that, too, because... Uh, I've got a quick question for Karen. Um, the, uh, uh, the PACE program, 
how does that work with the uh, paying for it through the property taxes? Are their taxes temporarily increased? Yeah, so basically there's um, a third party capital provider that will provide the funding for making the improvements to the property. And then the property owner receives a betterment assessment on their tax bill to pay back that capital investment. And then well, it gets funneled back to the capital provider. I see. So the town gives uh, the, uh, the business a break uh, on the taxes. Um, no, so a capital, so that there's no town money involved, a capital, a third party capital provider fronts the money to make an improvement to right. um, the property. And then that money is paid back through the tax bills. So the business will get an assessment for their, you know, annual payment on that uh, loan. I see. I see. Okay, thank you. So the benefit is that it, it gives better terms there's better terms available and that it stays with the property. So if the property owner thinks they might sell, they don't have to worry about factoring that into their equation yeah. of, you know, are they going to see the benefit? Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like a great program. Mm -hmm. Probably a dumb question, but uh, for a tax exempt property, like uh, a religious organization, the PACE program doesn't work, does it? Like it's a good question. It's not a dumb question at all because um, the PACE program, the Massachusetts PACE program does apply to nonprofit entities. Um, the tricky thing is how most of those nonprofit entities don't get a tax bill, right, <laughs> from mm -hmm. the town. Um, so if there was a nonprofit that was interested in taking advantage of the program, that would be a conversation with the town, whether they would and could figure out how to do that kind of assessment for a nonprofit entity. But the statewide program as a whole, nonprofits are eligible for that. Okay, good. Because uh, like for First Parish, where we're thinking of doing a big heating system upgrade, it would be nice to figure out how to take advantage of that. Um, but yeah, okay. Did you say that nonprofits don't pay property taxes and it would because of that that they um, would not be eligible to get a credit or get a tax break on it so it's not a it's not a tax break and it's not a credit it's just a financing mechanism for investing in improvements to a building so the state's program under the state's um, law nonprofit entities are eligible to participate in the financing program. Um, it's new, so it's still, you know, working out how that would play out with nonprofit entities that do not receive a tax bill at the moment. So they are eligible under the state program, um, but we would have to figure out how that could work um, at the town level. How many nonprofits uh, pay payments in lieu of taxes? I mean, I know I, I don't like know. General Hospital, Harvard University, they do, but I don't know whether, say, Emerson Hospital does. I don't know. I, I was really interested to read the work that the intern did on the uh, historic properties. That was really interesting and good stuff uh, recommended to anybody who has the time. Uh, God, I'm having a bad hair day. Yeah, you do. <laughs> All that cold weather behind you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, do you good. want to say anything about the uh, Library Corporation sustainability planning? Well, if we're ready to move on to the next agenda item, that is the next item. Are you ready? Do you have anything else to say about no, I'm ready to move on if folks are ready. Okay. okay. Um, so I want to do, Doug kindly gave me um, some time on the agenda today to give you an update and most importantly, to get your input on the Library Corporation's sustainability planning process. So I'm going to share my screen because I have a few slides to take us through the discussion. 
Um, okay. All right. Can you guys see these slides? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so I think you guys probably know this, but just to recap, the Library Corporation um, began this process of developing a sustainability plan earlier this year. Um, and I've been on the committee that's working on this project. Um, they've hired Greener U um, to help facilitate the process and Greener U um, developed, worked on Concrete Academy's um, plan and works with a lot of higher education. Um, so now we're in the point of the process where really getting feedback from community is really important. So that's why we're doing, a lot of us on the committee are doing these listening, listening sessions with different groups. Um, so I just wanna give you a little bit of info about the planning process and what's gonna go into the plan. So the goals for this process are, are one, to create an implementable action plan, a sustainability plan for the library corporation. Another important goal is that this plan is aligned with the town's goals and the town's plans and the state's goals. So I've been working with the team to really identify ways that we can connect this to the climate action plan and to all of Conquer's um, sustainability work. And then of course, um, engage the community and increase awareness throughout the process. So you might be curious who's on the committee. Um, here, I didn't make the group photo, um, but this, these are some of the folks that are participating in the process. As I mentioned, Greener U, um, there's folks from the library trustees and the library committee and um, myself, obviously a CCHS student um, and some other residents that are involved. And where we are in the process, I mentioned that, you know, we're now really digging into developing the plan. A lot of the work done um, at the end of the summer and into the fall was really baselining. We did some idea sessions, which I think Doug um, and I think a few of you attended. Um, and now we're in this phase of doing these listening sessions to gather more specific ideas that are gonna go into the plan development. And the whole process is, um, is hopefully will be done um, in February of next year, which will be here before you know it. So I sent around a link yesterday to this um, planning website. And I hope if you haven't had a chance to take a look yet that you'll take a look. Um, it really covers a lot of the, the baseline information that's been gathered and some ideas for what's gonna go into the plan based on Green RU's recommendation. There's also a survey that folks can take um, and this is just a temporary site that's up as part of the planning process. So we'll be updated with more stuff as we go, um, but it's kind of the landing page for all of the, the work that's going on. And some of the things that, that are really included in the baseline that you guys might be interested in digging into the details on is um, looking at the library's greenhouse gas emissions, obviously as a real um, top line metric, building energy use, mobility, materials and resources, and a lot of the educational programming. Um, there, you know, as I mentioned, the goal, one of the core goals of the process is to connect to the town's plans and the town's goals. So some of those connections are, are included in the baseline, um, as well as information on the expansion and renovation project. So looking forward, the sustainability plan um, is going to be broken out into these two focus areas. One is the built environment and operations. So that's the building itself, um, what goes into operating it, and building improvements and renovations down the line. And the other focus area is education and outreach. And obviously, the library you know, plays a really unique role in this. Um, so this includes programming, educational resources, communications, events, and the like that the library can provide. So these are the questions I have for you all today. Um, so I will open it up for, for discussion and feel free to answer any of these, but hoping to kind of hone in on, you know, what ideas you have for opportunities, specific actions or tactics that should be under each of these focus areas. Um, and then based on CSEC's experience doing a lot of community engagement and outreach, how do you think the library can be successful um, in outreach and education about sustainability and climate? Um, and then just kind of blue sky, if you have thoughts on how the library could really show leadership with their sustainability plan. 
So I will stop talking and just open it up for discussion and feel free to just answer one or all of these um, or whatever comes to mind. And, and Doug, feel free to cut us off when we're, we're at time if, um, okay. if we get there. I think this is, uh, this sounds like a very interesting plan that, I mean, it, it's, it's a high level plan right now, but I like the way it's, um, it's mapped out. I'm, I'm kind of interested in this because I've been involved with the uh, middle school committee and I'll talk about that in a little bit, <clears throat> but I think the middle school committee could take some, uh, some lessons from what you put together as a framework here. Um, on, on guiding question number one, one thing I'd kind of like to see, and I'm admittedly a geek on this stuff, uh, I'd like to see the library make the data usage available on a real-time basis in the building. I think, for example, it'd be nice to have a, a meter or a set of meters in a visible place where people could come in and see, okay, well, here's how much electricity we're using right now and here's how much we're generating and you know here's the temperature inside here's the temperature outside here's what that means for heat loss that stuff could be presented in a very visible way and I think it'd be very appropriate for a library thanks that feeds exactly with so thank you for sending that Kate I did go through the the survey um, and said in fewer but per perhaps less eloquent words um, echoing Jerry's sentiment of making it sort of a, a living lab of what are we doing? How did we do it? What can you do? Um, as, I mean, the library is perfectly suited as a space to do that where John Q. Public goes in um, and can get more information. Yeah, that's great. It becomes an example for the community. Mm-hmm. And we compared yet on a baseline uh, usage what the the main library in the West Concord, uh, the Fowler, used per square foot um, for heating and lighting compared to other town buildings or schools, things like that. The baseline includes, they did a comparison to other libraries, and I actually suggested that they do that, look at compared to, to town buildings. I'm not sure if that's been added yet, but if not, I mean, that's information that is that I is readily available to me. There was one statistic I came across in looking at that uh, material that you sent her that was on that the website, uh, something about, um, the library represents one and a half percent of the town's emissions. And I'm like, is that of all emissions in the entire town or is that of town owned build emissions from town owned buildings or town owned buildings and vehicles? And um, so it just wasn't clear what that one half percent was and how does that compare to, if it's one and a half percent of the emissions, is it also one and a half percent of the square footage? Or is it 3% of the square footage or is it, you know, three quarters of a percent, you know, how does that stack up? The other, and then there was one thing that was surprising was, um, I know you, you're part of this committee, so presumably you agree with this, but I, I found it a little surprising that there was a statement that said the town has focused on vehicular emissions. And I'm not sure I would have said that. I'm not sure if that's been in our, our intent or if it's, I mean, I'm not sure exactly where it says that, but I mean, the, the website was put together by Greener U, so I've looked at a lot of it, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm not, without knowing the context, I'm not sure what they were getting at there, but I mean, transportation but, emissions make up 40% of the community, so I think it's fair to say that it's a significant focus area of the town's sustainability efforts. Well, and I think it is more visible. You know, you don't, you see vehicles, you don't see, you know, when, well, you can see solar panels, but you don't see insulation. You don't really notice, you know, heat pumps, things like that, so. Mm -hmm. One thing I felt when I was in the meeting that I went to was that 
the context of the questions that were being asked was a little bit thin in terms of um, people being able to understand where they were coming from, partly because of their lack of familiarity with the project in, in a deeper way. So it was hard to get a, a sense of how individual questions fitted into the larger whole, I thought. Um, it was hard a little bit for me to understand what the relevance of certain questions were when they were asking them. I, I think if I was closer to the project, I would have felt a little bit better connected. But I don't know how to... Yeah, I mean, that's... A session that I attended and they had a lot of questions, but I never had a sense of whether the, the kinds of feedback that people were giving them were really being helpful or not helpful, but they were being all collected for sure. Yeah, and that's helpful feedback that I can pass along to Green or you. I mean, the, that was early on in the process, right? So the purpose of, of this listening session that I'm doing now and that others are doing is, you know, given the information that you've seen, what would you like to see in the plan? Like, what do you, what do you want to see going forward? How do you think the library can show leadership as this plan is shaping up? So if anyone has other thoughts on that, that'd be great. Yeah. Okay. Different. Can, one, one of the things that I, one, one of the things I had mentioned in um, the session that I was in was that some of the use of the library that is going to be in the, in the children's center or in the, the, the center that's between the old the new building that's being built the new being renovated and the old library that that be used for more than just a book purposes but be used for um sort of you know, there was a time when they were talking about having a maker space type of utility in the library. And um, it struck me that some of the, the library could be focused around the educational, like the, this is connecting to the educational part of the mission of the library. We're having audio problems with you, Doug. I, he sounds good to me. Yeah, I could hear you, Doug. Okay. Um, yeah. And uh, have, have that be an active part of the library experience and not just be about book lending and to take on a bigger role too. I think there was a time when we had talked about the idea of having these things like kits that the library had that could be used for verifying certain things like the monitors that are used for electrical monitoring in a household could conceivably be something that could be lended from the library, or if there were, uh, this may seem kind of like a wacky idea, but it's just one of the ideas that came forth for induction ovens and things like that for use. If they had pot sets or pans and things like that could be conceivably used to, so that if people needed to learn about how to, take certain steps, that there, there would be some of the tools for them to learn that at the library. Yeah, and that came up yesterday. Apparently, Brookline, their library um, has a, an induction cooktop that they loan out so folks can kind of test it out with their pans and see if it's, um, you know, something that will, will work for them before they make that transition. So that's... The library has an infrared meter that you can loan out. 
And I was involved at the Museum of Science with a kiosk that showed electric meter with the wind turbines on the roof. So there are people who can do that type of interface and we could make a little kiosk of energy saving. I think it is doable and it wouldn't be that expensive. Oh uh, yeah, cool. It's like if somebody wanted to have a meter that would monitor their electrical usage in their house of the refrigerator or something like that. Yeah, the library has a, it's called a kilowatt and it's a, it's a device that you can check out. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I don't want to take up too much time, but thank you for your input and I'll um, send the link around again in case you want to take another look and submit any um, feedback um, through the website uh, and I'll keep you posted on the project as it moves forward. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I have next in here, uh, the planning board liaison update. Karen, do you have anything to say about the, your connection to the, the planning board? Um, this was the first planning board meeting that I'd gone to. And, um, so I was, um, uh, interested to hear everything they were talking about. I don't know uh, how much was relevant to what CSEC is doing, but there was um, discussion of a, a possible subdivision that crosses Sudbury and Concord lines, but the planning board was not inclined to approve it because there was no direct access to Concord um, or to the Concord portion of the, of the land. And so um, uh, I don't know where that's going. I don't think it's... Um, anything was decided, but it was an interesting uh, wrinkle in the proposal. Um, there was a lot of discussion, um, again, about the Main Street and Center Street division, which is now um, a 16 lot subdivision. Uh, a lot of the concerns are still surrounding the amount of soil that would need to be removed, the, um, the possible runoff, the stormwater runoff, um, the safety during the um, during the construction. So um, that project is ongoing. Um, and there was some question of whether or not uh, the town wanted to purchase one of the lots or some of the land for public land space. So I think that's still an outstanding question, if I understood correctly. And then the other, um, the third major thing that they talked about, which I was not aware of, but they are, um, there is a group seeking to create, um, I think it was a three-story um, building down on Commonwealth Ave in West Concord. And so they were looking for a variance for the height restrictions. They've been working with the West Concord Advisory Committee responding to many of their concerns. And the one thing that I will say that um, was good was that, um, somebody on the board, I don't remember who, raised the issue of asking them to include electric vehicle chargers in the residences that um, it, it's gonna be a mixed use, um, uh, commercial and residence um, uh, construction. And uh, so when there was discussion about electric vehicle um, infrastructure and, and how you monitor it, how you, you know, if you put it out where it's publicly available and so the, and the sort of bottom line was, well, see what you can do about getting it into the residences at, at, the, at least. So that was good. Okay. Any questions? Thank you, Karen. Sure. Um, the next item on the agenda is the CMLP liaison update. And uh, Jerry, you've been the liaison to them. Yep. Um, do you have any news on that front? Yeah, I do. Um, so uh, I'll talk a little bit about CMLP directly and a little, little bit more about uh, the Concord Middle School project because that intersects with CMLP. Um, so I uh, attended the CMLP meeting uh, yesterday morning uh, I think the, the main thing um, to comment on or, or relate is uh, the energy mix is changing uh, over the next five years. 
uh, natural gas is uh, dropping, uh, the use of natural gas is dropping, and the use of nuclear is going up dramatically. So in 2025, uh, uh, the plan is at the moment that a quarter of our supply will come from nuclear. So I think that's ramping up partly because natural gas is ramping down, but I think there's concern, long-term concern over the wreck purchases. Where, where is the nuke plant that we're getting sourcing it from? It's a good question. I, I don't know. I, I, I meant to ask and forgot. So they've got some forward contract. It, in fact, it, it doesn't even kick in and, well, it's already kicked in, but it's kicked in in a very small way uh, this year, just a percent or two. And then it, it ramps up in a couple of years where it's a, it's a full quarter of our supply. So they, um, they're getting it from Seabrook. From Seabrook? Okay. Um, so the other thing I want to report is uh, the progress or lack of progress on the Concord Middle School. Um, the Middle School Building Committee hasn't met uh, since March, but they'll resume uh, next month. And I don't think the Sustainability Subcommittee has met either during that time, but uh, the chair of that subcommittee, uh, Matt Root and uh, Charlie Park and I have been meeting. And we've uh, come up with a, uh, basically a, a framework for, by which CMLP and CMS can kind of talk to each other about options and what the options mean for the school and, and CMLP. Uh, and we met with Dave Wood this morning on that, and uh, he's, he's on board. You know, the, uh, the, the plan makes sense to him. But I think the, uh, the, the, the main news, or the first part of the main news, is that uh, uh, he's, he, he seems to be a, a full partner in this. He, he wants to do this. He sees the opportunity at the middle school as an opportunity to... Uh, satisfy town desires to increase the, uh, uh, the level of uh, uh, non-emitting uh, energy in the town. He also sees it as an opportunity to get a battery because uh, without it, we really can't expand much in the way of solar. And he's feeling pressure from residents to add solar. So I think all that's, uh, all that's pretty positive. Uh, the next step is he'll meet with the superintendent, Laurie Hunter, to talk about this. Um, now, I think this is kind of the easy part. I think the harder part's going to come when the school and CMLP have to face up to the uh, finances of this. Um, Bob, la last time you gave me some interesting data, you know, about what, uh, what the PPAs were in Acton, uh, which were, that's a very aggressive pricing. But what we're hearing from uh, Belmont is that they couldn't go with PPAs there because they're an MLP as we are here. And uh, apparently you, you may know this far better than I do, but apparently uh, uh, the incentives that are not available to MLPs kind of make the difference here. So in Belmont's case, they went with a behind the meter um, installation, which here in Concord, it would appear from what we've heard from the building committee, they don't want to touch that. So that we see some potential conflict coming into play there. And uh, one, one last thing, I think they don't want to there touch. may be a role for CSEC in all this um, in terms of building public support uh, for the PV and the battery at the school. Um, that, that uh, so when speaking with, uh, 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 well, Brian, you know him, uh, Phil Thayer in Belmont, um, he was explaining to me the most important thing for them was to build community support through various town committees, the select board, FinCom, et cetera. And so I can foresee we're going to need to do that here for the CMS project. I, I don't quite know when that kicks in or what that looks like, but I, I think that may be an important item for this committee to consider. Very good. Hey, Ray. Uh, That'll I have do it. a question for you. Um, yeah. The, the realignment of the mix of the energy portfolio that they're talking about, does it include any more renewables or wind or biomass based or anything hydro? 
or is it all nuclear? Um, just eyeballing it. I, there's a graph I'm looking at. Um, just eyeballing it, it's pretty much all nuclear. I guess, what, what's the blue there? I think hydro's increased a little bit. The rest of it is fairly flat. Wind's gone up a little bit. Yeah, that's the, that's the diagram right there. Could you share that graph with us? Um, yeah, although who, who's projecting it? What do you mean projecting it? Someone's got it displayed. Muted, oh, yeah. Sorry, I was muted. Um, this is Brian. So what I'll do is I'll send a link to the point in the video from the meeting uh, that shows this, because this is just my picture of my screen. That's why it's got that funny casting over it. Uh, but I'll, I'll send you a link. Uh, can I send it to, to Jerry? And Jerry, can you send it to CSEC? I don't know if I have everyone. Sure thing. Yeah, right. no problem. But yeah, this is, this is the uh, Seabrook contract that's kicking in in purple. The hashed purple is uh, in December, there's an option that Dave can execute um, to add to that existing contract at the same price which he says he's considering. How come things like wind or the hydro are tapering off so much? So um, one thing to know that this is uh, the existing contracts and contracts end. It doesn't mean we have to stop that agreement. It could be renewed, uh, but it would, that's why it tails off in the future. Right. So that's, that's commitments, right? So, you know, we, we buy a hundred percent, but we don't, we're only committed to. Uh, we normally buy about uh, 80, 85% because we want to have some, ex some flexibility in the spot market at 10 to 15%, maybe even 20%. I, I, I mean, the hundred percent is represents all electricity in town. So not, not all of it is, con is, is under contract, but. All electricity that comes through the substation. Yep. I had Pam Dritt point out that there is production in town behind this that isn't shown. What, what is the difference between the 9% that's in pink stripe and the pink that's 26%? Um, the, the, the pink stripe is what Dave was talking about in the meeting. He's able to execute an option within the existing pink contract uh, to do more. Uh, and that's where uh, he's leaning. Huh. I, I guess I was of the impression that there was going to be more growth and commitment to wind or uh, solar or other renewable forms of energy than nuclear, per se. Yeah. Well, I think uh, my, my impression, Brian, you, I'm sure you know this in more detail than I do, but you know, the wrecks aren't shown here. So, um, a fair portion, I don't know the number, but a fair portion of the CMLP portfolio, let me, let me restart that. A fair portion of CMLP's ability to get to hundred percent non-renewable, I'm sorry, hundred percent non-emitting is, uh, through RECs. So there's a, there's a lot of rep purchases that um, counterbalance the natural gas contracts we have. They counterbalance it, I see. Are there any graphs that you can, at your disposal that show any of that stuff? Well, um, so here is, uh, their, their website talking about their power supply. And this is what the, the carbon free electricity. So you can see here that Concord Light has been lowering its emissions rate for the power it purchases. The reason this is at 64% is the, uh, the rec purchases and the offset. Okay. Did that answer your question, Doug? Yeah, more or less. 
Good. I think we need to keep moving on. Okay. Thank you, Brian, for showing those graphs. That was sure. Pretty yeah, visuals always help. You were more prepared than I was. I was doing it on the fly. <laughs> I just, <laughs> just have this all open anyway. All right, thanks. So that's all and I've got, unless there are other questions. The mask. Okay, thank you, Jerry. You bet. Uh, do we have an uh, update from you, Brad, about the mass energize? Yeah, um, I, I, it's getting a little late. I'd like to show you quickly the site because we did a big uh, website up, update and I want to invite people to visit it. Uh, can I show it on the screen? I'll try to keep it to uh, three minutes or so. If I do share screen and I go here, and I say share. Um, this is um, right here. You see that? Uh, this is the 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 Cooler Concord uh, the, the the site you can get to through CoolerConcord.org, which is the Mass Energized site, uh, and it has um, it's been updated in a number of ways. So, for example, there are uh, um, some cards here. So anybody that can come on here, I happen to be signed in as myself. If I go to take action, you'll see a number of actions uh, that have been defined on the site, such as uh, getting uh, no cost home energy assessments, things like that, uh, heat pumps. Um, I can, uh, so uh, Janet and Karen have done some editing on, on the action content uh, a while ago. And um, if I go into an action, I can find out about uh, steps to take. Um, in this case, I can even contact a uh, coach and find out about about heat, you know, what, what could a heat pump do for me. Now this, um, the site is linked to uh, a carbon calculator underneath it. So the when you take actions, uh, the, so there's very few people that are signed up for the site. These are actually actions that were defined by who had done solar as of a few years ago. Um, but when you sign up and uh, you would be counted as a household engaged and uh, counting what what you do and what the at typical carbon reduction would be for that. Um, and I, uh, it links to uh, things like the town uh, sustainability site. Oh, there's that uh, thing and stuff. So I'd, uh, I would love to get people to uh, visit it, give their impressions, make a profile and uh, record actions that you've taken and even uh, uh, right now, we don't have any testimonials on the site, but if you want to snap a photo of something and uh, and and leave a testimonial, you can up, up, upload that. It gets curated, but these are the types of things uh, that one can do. And uh, we've um, one of the big improvements that we've made is having teams. So there's a bunch of teams and I'm going to be trying to meet with uh, people from let's say first parish or the uh, or the high school or things like that to form some goals, try to get people uh, doing sustainable stuff. Um, so I'd love it if anybody has any, uh, wants to check it out and and give us feedback. I, I we're ready to start promoting it. Um, if uh, you know, and uh, so we can have a newsletter about it and stuff like that. There's a lot of other, one can also check out other communities. So there's several other communities that are, uh, that are going, Wayland, uh, Jewish Climate Action Network, uh, there's Framingham and Newton. Newton is very, very active and they have, they're actually using it as a key part of their climate action plan in the town directing people there for, uh, you know, how to t undertake the, uh, the big 
uh, actions that are going to reduce their greenhouse gases. I just want to mention that. Um, anyway, please, this took a lot of work because volunteer software uh, development is uh, takes time and effort. Uh, so you can go to community.massenergize.org to check it out, or you can go to coolerconquered.org, which is kind of aliased to our the uh, the site we set up for Concord. Um, anyway, that's my update. Uh, I think it's going pretty well. We've also our organization has been applying for some grants, uh, and we're. Um, having regular communities meeting uh, where we talk about, you know, what's working in this, in your community versus your community and, and, and sort of ideas on policy, uh, stuff like that. Very excited about it. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Do you have anything to say about the Heat Smart pro program? Well, the, the, so the Heat Smart Alliance has been busy still. Uh, there's been some really interesting, uh, I'd actually encourage anybody who wants to connect to the Heat Smart Alliance to that's interested in heat pumps and stuff like that. You don't have to be a world's expert to get a lot out of it. Uh, but so we're developing coaching um, materials that are being that are starting to be used in uh, several communities, and they involve uh, the process of how you interact with homeowners, avoid liabilities, um, and um, you know help people to think about about heat pumps in particular. Uh, we are also are been doing some really interesting uh, technical presentations. Um, because a lot of times these systems do not live up to manufacturer specs. Manufacturer specs are designed to be, you know, something piece of equipment measured under some laboratory conditions. And then when you actually put them in a home and those aren't controlled laboratory conditions, they, they could behave quite differently. Uh, so there's a couple, some very technical people that are monitoring systems and looking at systems that are are not well designed in houses. In particular, if you um, if you just say, okay, we're going to oversize the system. We want to make sure people are warm. Uh, you end up with a system that is quite poor, poor performing and doesn't come anywhere near the efficiency of the manufacturer because it just cycles on and off. It can't stay in an, uh, in the in a, a continuous uh, range, which which heat pumps like to work at. They like to be so sort of always on uh, pumping a little bit of heat into your home on a, on a moderately cold day. So there's been a lot of learning there, um, quite interesting stuff. Um, we meet once a month. If anybody wants to get involved, even just, uh, you know, one can be an associate and uh, participate at whatever level they like, uh, let me know. And that includes for any any community members. Thank you. Any other questions about that from anybody? Okay, moving right along. Um, Janet, do you have anything you wanted to spend a little bit of time of rep NLP's customer survey update? For EV, I don't, I don't have anything that? on a customer survey update from this, this from is was something a couple of months ago, but I don't have anything new on that. There was the um, the local leadership roundtable, which was uh, several six, I think, uh, local dealers talking about the cars they had available, and they uh, talked. For, um, there was a live session on October the 20th, and then they replayed the presentation um, on the following Saturday. And they, um, the presentation was followed by a question time, and it was on Saturday, it was still a live question time. 
a hundred households signed up to attend, though um, not as many people actually showed up. About 50 showed up on the Tuesday for the live session and then um, 11 or 13 um, showed up on the Saturday. I mean, people, people start and then they drop out and so you can't really, it's hard to see how much necessary, you know, people may, may have dropped out too soon. But the, I listened in on Tuesday and it was a very lively um, question and answer session. The presentation was, to my eyes, was less than ideal because they, the dealers just had a slide showing a vehicle and they never showed their faces. And it was sort of, I don't know. Um, anyway, and uh, the criticism from CMLP was that there wasn't enough on actually owning the vehicle. Um, we know what it was like to own a vehicle in the presentation. And um, they thought it might be better to have breakout sessions the next time they do it so that people who wanted to talk about a sp specific type of car or they could, uh, could, could do that. Um, anyway, it, I think overall it went well. I don't know how effective it was in getting people to buy cars. Um, then the EV ready update, you know, for, for multi-unit dwellings, uh, CML, CMLP finally finished the analysis for Mildam, which is very expensive because they have two separate parking lots uh, to they to do or you know uh, dedicated um, charging for every parking space would require a lot of trenching, so they they have the. The condominium owners haven't decided what they're going to do, whether they're going to start with um, one parking lot, um, part of a parking lot. Anyway, um, I think Janice said he was going to meet with them to explain it, and I haven't heard any more of what they've decided. So I think that's it. Oh, and, and they were going to they were looking for new members for the EV working group. Um, wondering who was interested and um bob i know you always get the emails and they and i know you were interested at some point but um you were thinking that maybe the meeting time was not the best for people so if you haven't got an email yet from janicetti you probably will get one yeah uh I'd, I'd like to second that um, the EV working group, I've been on it, and now that I'm a light board member, I'm not allowed to be on it. Um, and it has done a great job at really removing barriers to EV adoption in, in, a, in a practical, executable way. Um, so I highly recommend anyone who has the time um, to consider helping out Janet and uh, the EV working group who is doing good stuff. How long have you been on the light board now? And when did you switch over from being uh, involved with the EV group? Because I know you were very involved. Yeah, I've, I've only done two, two light board meetings. So after town meeting, I was appointed to the light board and we've only had two meetings. So okay. not a lot of time yet. Um, Brian was a terrific force on the EV working group, really pushing CMLP to look at things that they hadn't thought of, including considering multi-unit dwellings. Okay. Well, moving right along, um, item 11, or the 10, 10, the adult education update. I, I don't really have much to say on that, except that I intend to continue to follow up on it, but I haven't really made much progress with it. Uh, that email from uh, Brad with some ways of connecting to them and probably filling out a form that would describe a, 
a course that we would do that would be like a one hour to three hour overview. And what I had in mind is something that tracked along with the brochure and pamphlet that we had done last year uh, that would be kind of an overview of different kinds of uh, things that could be done in a household to improve the sustainability on it. But I haven't gotten very far with that, I'm sorry. Um, the number 11, the CAB li liaison update. What, um, this past week, both Brad and I had a chance to meet with <laughs> Swenson, who's the new head of the CAB board. And, and, I, and Brad and I brainstormed about <laughs> ways that we could get in better alignment with um, Maybe frozen. <laughs> and the CAB board was more about developing policy. Jake sent back um, some information to us. He's nice to you to learn and discuss how we can best work together going forward. Thanks for setting up the conversation. I just wanted to share this executive summary snapshot from a recent Rocky Mountain Institute report on building electrification economics that you can probably follow up. You, you probably seen. there's a copy of that building that um, electrifying economics of electrifying buildings report in the meeting materials area on the Google Drive. And if anybody wants it, I can get them the link. The recommendations, he says, serve as a good roadmap for what the town and CMLP needs to try and accomplish to support electrification. And he, he referred to page 10 of it in particular. And there's five priorities that I'll just read that he discussed as being particularly relevant. One is to provide prioritize rapid electrification of buildings currently using propane and heating oil. Two is to stop supporting the expansion of the natural gas distribution system, including for new homes. Three is to bundle demand flexibility programs and new rate designs and electric and energy efficiency with electrification initiatives. And four was to expand demand flexibility options for existing electric space and water heating loads. And the last one was to update energy efficiency resource standards and related goals. I know those are pretty high level, but they kind of summarized what he identified as being really important about what the CAB board was looking at. Maybe, do you have any comments to this, Kate? Is she still on with us? I'm here. Um, I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to in terms of Jake's email, but I mean, CAB is looking at implementing the climate action plan that was finished this summer. And so one of those priorities is electrification of buildings. And so right now they're focusing in on um, new construction because that's um, what's top of mind and, and part of the RMI accelerator. So that's what they were discussing most of their meeting yesterday. Um, you know, obviously the existing buildings piece is a big piece of the puzzle as well. So um, I think there's a lot of opportunity. I, I know I said this last time, but I think there's a lot of opportunity for CAB and CSAC to be um, very much aligned with what, what you're working on. One thing I just, saw, um, I just saw a couple of days ago was that Jeff Bezos has given a $10 million grant to RMI for the purpose of uh, electrifying and improving energy efficiency of, I think, well, it's buildings. I, mean, I think commercial buildings. I don't know whether that is at all relevant to what to Congo or whether they're going to focus on New York City. But it's an interesting piece of information. Such a nice guy.
I hope that in the next couple of months that I can attend some of the CAB meetings. And um, I think Brad wanted, he had expressed an interest in it too, but to stay as closely aligned with Jake as we can. So, um, and remember that all, all committee meetings, including this one, are recorded and on YouTube. So even if you can't make something live, you can always get caught up afterwards. I meant to go and I, I, I stayed today. Can, uh, maybe we can have the CAB agenda just pumped to our committee once uh, on the week of it. Um, and uh, I could do that or something, but uh, it's so easy to forget stuff and not, and not have it on your calendar. That's my problem. I, I yeah, to and to get the link, I guess, to, to uh, get to the link into the meeting, what do we just have to go to the sustainability if you go to the town calendar, uh, all the uh, meetings uh, are on the town calendar. Stuff. If you go to the town calendar, all the meeting the are there and they all have the link. I, have I, to get more I did that to get that. I did that to get to this meeting. I didn't see it directly on the calendar, but on the agenda. Well, that's what we've been doing is adding it to the agenda. That's part of the new template for the agenda. It's very helpful. Yes. Thank you, Kate, for insisting on that. It is open, um, so not, not my invention. It's required. Yeah, it was required. Anyway, um, I wish I had a little bit more to say about the CAB liaison work, but I just, I think it's a matter of keeping abreast of what's going on in both sides. And uh, we'll continue to talk to Jake about how to be in better alignment. And if there's news to bring it forth to the rest of the committee. The next thing on this, um, agenda that I have is the CSEC strategy going forward. Brad has worked hard on the strategy plan since we talked last time. And I made an effort to put together a, some kind of a potential plan going forward that I've shared with only Brad and Kate. And it's pretty rudimentary, but Brad was going to spend some time going over his plan as where it is now, and we can talk and have discussion about potential, how, how that, where that leads us in terms of project ideas. Right. So, uh, go ahead, Brad. With the, the, sure. So, Doug, what Doug, Doug did was very much uh, along the same lines as what I did, and I and, and we since we weren't talking to each other, maybe have been some duplication of effort, but. Uh, I made, I put together a, uh, a five shot slide uh, presentation about it that I'd love to lead you through, if that's all right. Um, so what do I hit leave? No, I hit uh, share screen. Uh, and so this is, um, um, this is to, um, let me see. Uh, tools, range, themes, present. Present? Yeah, something like that. Um, this is intended to be uh, not a complete, uh, completely well thought out project, but the ideas of how I think we could uh, fit into the scheme of uh, helping people electrify. And uh, so it's a work in progress. I haven't had a chance to talk to, to uh, to too many people about it. I've talked to uh, a couple people in CSEC and a couple of others. And um, it's this is kind of a, the last week I showed that strategic plan draft, which is sort of a, wasn't really a plan, but a sketch of everything we could do. And we decided to try to focus on one major item, which is home heating. And, um, that's because it's big. It's it's like thirty percent of the energy emissions uh, in town, 
And each residence has a pretty high impact of maybe on average eight to 10 tons of, of CO2 emissions per year. So it's, it's a chunk. It's uh, the biggest, uh, besides changing your car, it is about the biggest thing that you can do. But it's hard and it's gonna take, it would take a lot of collaborating with CMLP and CAB and other players in order to be successful. Um, and we wanna take advantage of, of more and more emissions free electricity. Um, electricity right now is a fairly small fraction of our energy use, maybe 20 to 25%. That's kind of a nationwide average. I don't know what it is in Concord, but Again, transportation and buildings is what we want to be shifting into uh, electrical use. And we don't want to be compromising comfort, comfort or performance. Uh, but since it's expensive uh, uh, and complicated, residents need help. And that's kind of what we are about. Um, so we have had heating programs before, and we've learned a bunch of stuff. Um, we did something called Green Your Heat, uh, I guess it's 2015, 2016, where a grant, there was a grant proposal and most Massachusetts homeowners, uh, what, no matter what they heat with, are eligible for money for uh, weatherizing their home. But it was not true for Concord for oil heated homes or uh, only, only gas heated homes. So there was a, a program where we managed to get 150 homes uh, approximately weatherized and got really great returns to homeowners. You know, they got sort of free stuff because of a grant which was applied. And Gilda, who's on this call, was heavily involved with that. It was a great program. Uh, um, and then uh, HeatSmart the other year, we there were heat pumps installed in about 90 homes, much more than during a comparable period. Um, due to another grant funded program. Uh, and that built upon our interest group that we've had for several years. And now um, these programs kind of, uh, they, they can have a, uh, a life of their own after the program is done. So this has really led to that Heat Smart Alliance we talked about which is having a bigger impact. So that's the, ki that's the kind of thing to aim for. Now CMLP is doing work to promote heat pumps. Jan Assetti is a hero on the Heat Smart Alliance. She's working very hard uh, and running the coaching working group. And also uh, she's, they have contracted with Abode Energy Management, uh, which is a Concord based company, but they're uh, very, a lot of skilled people in both uh, building performance and, uh, and electrification. Uh, and so they're going to be managing, they're gonna be doing a few things. This is to, uh, the short synopsis, managing approved contractor list, inclusive, meaning they don't want like two or three contractors. They'd like to give you um, all of the contractors that are, uh, that are installing heat pump systems in homes and in ways that meet uh, our qualifications. Uh, they're going to be reviewing installation proposals uh, to make sure that they're rebate eligible. Like I mentioned, where some systems are oversized or under, you know, uh, they want to make sure that what's installed is good. And that's because uh, heat pumps are a little trickier than just a fossil fuel system that you can, you can oversize and it's going to be, and it's going to be just fine. Um, and then they're going to be managing two uh, community heat pump coaches that are going to be paid. And this is a plug for anybody on the call or to think about someone you know that might want a job like this, a part-time job, $25 an hour, um, really fun interacting with residents and helping them through this process. So there's two jobs that are open and that are the requisition is open. And Jan sent uh, something around. I think you might have all seen it. But um, if you know someone who might be interested, even if they're not from Concord, uh, that would be great if you can uh, uh, pass it on. 
or send them to, to me or uh, or Jan. That'd be uh, great. Um, so I'm I'm just borrowed some words from a webinar I was on uh, yesterday, which is called "Raising Our Level of Ambition," uh, because uh, if we want to meet the challenge, we need to reach all the households. Doesn't mean we need to convert all the households, but we kind of need to uh, to uh, help people electrify. And um, we don't want to just cast the net and see what comes in because we'll get the same, we'll get a few less than last time. Uh, and so I've put some ideas together in a one page summary. Um, and I, I'll just, uh, so, um, I want to target a direct promotion, promotion to homeowners that are likely to benefit. That means, in my view, they are likely to find that heating costs are a little lower and comfort is higher. And that's oil and electric and propane heat, of which there are about 2,500 homes. Uh, that, that's according to the assessor's database um, in that category. Um, and we want, uh, so designing a campaign that, that, that really uh, reaches out to those homes and uh, through direct uh, mail and phone and trying to get people to say, yeah, I'm interested to find out about this. And now, uh, uh, as I said, uh, Abode is gonna be doing the heat pump coaching. So we're, uh, my thought is we want to be just helping homeowners figure out what are the major options that you could do, weatherizing um, uh, heat pumps for all or part of your house, solar, because that could be a part of the, that could be the thing that makes it financially uh, accessible. And, and if we're gonna be making a touch to, you know, sizable fraction of conquered homes, we want to, uh, have our stuff together so that they can uh, decide um, whether to participate. Now, I've picked a, uh, a number, 250 homes a year as a target. And that's a really aggressive number because during HeatSmart, we've managed to uh, see some installations in 90 homes. Uh, but 250 is more along the scale of what the climate crisis needs in terms of that's, uh, that's about 5% of single family homes targeting 50% or more of heat usage. Now, in order, to, in order to succeed with that, we'd have to talk to a larger number of people. We'd have to find maybe 500 homeowners uh, that uh, want to talk to us which means we have to reach out to even an even large, we would have to reach out to an even larger number of people in order to have people willing to talk to us. Some people are going to say, I just installed a heat, heating system last year. Thank you. I don't have any time to talk to you. But other people are saying, yeah, I'd I should say, if it looks like a good value proposition, yeah, I'd like to spend a couple hours on this and, and end up with a home energy plan. Um, so, uh, this is kind of uh, uh, what I'm thinking about. And so um, we want to find out homeowners' goals and work within them. What's important to you? And we would like to include, um, as I said, weatherization, heat pumps, water heating, and solar PV. And um, there's very few homeowners you're going to go in and, and they're going to say, yeah, this is the time I got a pile of cash. I want to do all this stuff this year. Um, that's, that's, not the, uh, that's not the target audience. Usually it's going to be, yeah, well, this is interesting, but you know, I, um, I got a few more years left on my water heater or whatever, whatever it is. Uh, so we would like to, I, I'm, I'm suggesting Basic templated options. We want to be able to do a uh, kind of a simple assessment, um, not getting really creative or really technical, but we want to do a bit of home energy modeling. We want to say, is this is, is your home pretty efficient? 
or is it not efficient at all? And that would be from uh, uh, a fuel bill usage. So that's going to take a little bit of modeling, but we have some tools through the, the Heat Smart Alliance and some other uh, other possibilities of taking fuel bills and and figuring out whether this home is on the more efficient side, not efficient side. And um, if homes have already had home energy assessments from ENE, that would really fe feed right into this. But there are things that uh, that they might not. Uh, not have covered. Um, so um, the goal is to basically prepare homeowners to take the next step at the right time. And hopefully a lot of those homeowners would take a step, you know, in the same year, but some might take a step a few years down the line if they have uh, a plan that says, yeah, these are the options that are, are of interest to me to look at. Um, so I put together a, uh, a little flow chart. This is a big project and I'm thinking of it as a like a five year project, meaning uh, we want it's a lot of work in the first year to design a program. Um, and it will be a lot of continuing work to carry out a program. But since this is uh, this isn't something that goes away in a year and I, I was I've been thinking about it as something we kind of try to design and we get it in place and we keep on working on it. And so these first, this part is, we want to figure out a process for doing a, uh, a templated uh, assessment that, uh, that is of value. And we'd need to do um, a bunch of training. We would need to do enough training so that uh, whoever it is, whether it be a volunteer or a professional, they, uh, they know what they're talking about. They uh, they 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 go according to the program. We'd have to do some target market segment analysis out of the assessors database. I already got a, a recent copy of that, and uh, and possibly we could design a uh, kind of a living uh, auxiliary database that has you know homes, how much fuel they use, some stuff according to what we are. Uh, uh, data that we are collecting. And that could live beyond this program if, if, if it's of use to the town. Um, we will have to design an outreach campaign that's, for, that's effective. And uh, we might have to design a web intake platform if, if uh, cause that's, that's a way successful campaigns work. Um, and this is, so, um, if we got were to get through something like this, which would be an all hands effort, I think, um, we could do uh, outreach through community events, direct outreach, general promotion, because you have to hear about things multiple ways, no matter what. But we really, I'm really thinking the direct outreach is what we want to be, do effectively. And then, uh, we want to define a flow. This is kind of turning the crank, uh, um, you know, making an initial contact, figuring out what are the requirements for a particular home, doing a visit, real or virtual, if, uh, identifying options that that a homeowner could consider, and uh, and writing up a fairly simple plan with, you know, this is, you know, with um, uh, baseline prices. So, you know, a system like this is going to cost around in the order of X. And it might be more than that because every home's different. And but and 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 your fuel, your your electricity use or or your energy savings or greenhouse gas savings would be around X, but a different, you know, every home being different, uh, you actually have to talk to the professional to find out that, you know, you have to go to the next stage to figure that out. So this is kind of uh, the pot of ideas I've been thinking about. Um, and um, we have a lot of human resources. This committee is full of talented people. And there's other, you know, with CAB and 
uh, working together with CMLP or the schools or, or other community organizations, uh, I think that will, that would make this program, uh, could make it effective. You know, it would take us a while to get town approval. Um, it would take us more time to, to design the program. And starting a program, you know, you could conceivably start a program in the middle of next year if you were, uh, if we were aggressive. But then, uh, then we could have, uh, yeah, if we got that far, every month we would be, we or uh, ideally we would have uh, professionals working alongside us or doing most of the work. So there's gonna, this is gonna be not cheap. Um, it's gonna take funding either from the town but, or grants if they're available. Uh, so for example, last yesterday, there was Mass CEC at a board meeting and they approved um, a $2 million for whole home decarbonization pilot program. And we could apply for something like that. It hasn't been fully defined yet. Uh, there might be other opportunities. Um, and then I, I really like to try to think about uh, and uh, it, aiming to design a process that works for Concord and might work for some other towns too, if we, uh, if we do it. Uh, if, if, if we define something that's anywhere near as successful as this. Um, so those are the ideas that I've been having. I wrote up a uh, uh, kind of a, a one page or a summary, but it's this this covered it. This uh, uh, this pretty much covers most of it and has the same flow diagram on it. Uh, I didn't mention a couple of things. Now, financing uh, is a very important barrier for some people, and it's not part of this program, but it's uh, something that um, that is cr critical for success, I think, and making sure that the incentives um, are there. I don't know if there's enough incentive to, uh, to do the weatherization work or, and CMLP is doing, uh, you know, rebates on heat pumps. Um, ideally, they'll be at so investor owned utilities have figured out that the incentives have to be pretty large in order for the incentive to really tilt the scale. Um, probably substantially higher than we have, but um, you know, having the right incentives are important as well. Um, the other thing I was thinking, so one of the things, this is a bit of a cartoon proposal again. I don't, I, uh, is this, uh, this assessment process where we start, where we contact home earner and we get to a home energy plan, one of the big challenges is, could we make this a four to six hour commitment, a volunteer effort or, or professional effort, or is it 20 hours, which would make it not doable or, or make it super expensive? Um, that I don't know yet. So I want to I want to keep talking to people and uh, try to hash out you know what does this what does this mean um, uh, get uh, a lot more input into this and um, so that is where I'm at with that is anybody any questions probably a few yeah um, well so. Starting at the end, I think you could get to a, a couple of hours um, with some experience and training because certainly people that are selling these things um, can't don't put in more than a couple of hours to be able to come up with a proposal for you. So the, the, um, the coach with some time and experience should get to a point of being able to do it within a, within a couple of hours. Um, I was wondering, as you were talking about the things, so we have assessors database that gives heating fuel and also the size uh, and um, the size of the of the home 
and the sort of vintage, you know, what year it was built, um, is, I think is in there. Surely CMLP has a list of who has received home audits and, and when? Right. Do we have copies or can we get those reports? Um, probably not for uh, at least, um, you know, there are privacy aspects to those reports. Uh, yeah, uh, that's what I was wondering. It's like, well, because I, I know that in, in general, you can't just get electric usage data, for example, usage data because of privacy concerns, but where the town is paying for that audit, then does that include that the town is able to, to look at that audit? Right. Um, I think we can find out who's had the, who's had the audits, although I'm not 100% 100, 100 sure. I mean, we might have to ask nicely and then ask again. Uh, uh, but as you say, the town is financing that. A homeowner who says, you know, I'm interested in participating in it, they would, they should provide us the audit. Uh, and, well, or provide us permission to get it from Energy New England. <laughs> yeah. They haven't necessarily saved it in a place they can find it. <laughs> right. Well, one of the, so one of the things, uh, uh, if we, if we end up design, uh, making something that's a home energy plan. And I'd like Brian Fools to help us design this plan because he's always talking about that stuff. Uh, <laughs> that would live with the homeowner and it would also live with us. And when the home is sold, that report with that, that home energy plan could, you know, could continue to live. Um, so, yeah, but, but, Things like who people who participated in the Green Your Heat program, they are a great. They would be a great source here. Uh, a lot of these. So I would say you take a targeted segment and then you say let's prioritize by running across uh, lists like that. Who had the home energy audits and stuff like that. And so we're going to have to do a lot of marketing. We're going to have to sit around uh, a virtual table and say you know. What are your ideas on on uh, prioritizing uh, our outreach? I think that's going to be a lot of fun, interesting, but we have to we have to kind of go at it with a uh, a business mentality. It, so, Brad, yeah, <laughs> um, I love uh, this. Is how we 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 turn policy into real action. This is how we stop doing one little campaign there, you know, reinvent the wheel, do another campaign, reinvent the wheel, do another campaign. This is the underlying um, CRM at, at Concord Light that I've been pushing for, which is, you know, the customer resource uh, management tool so that we can take the data from the assessor, we can validate it, we can um, get utility information very easily because we have CMLP providing it instead of the homeowner searching for all the old documents. Um, it's, it's taking all the projects and um, campaigns that were done in the past and kind of doing the hard work of pulling all that data together, having a professional person who's paid to do this as their job, be there and be available. And um, it, it's, it, this is a tremendous amount of work and committees in town have shown great enthusiasm for these ideas, but poor follow through. Yeah. Um, and so, and, and, you know, a year later after one of these projects goes, it's, it's Groundhog Day and you kind of start fresh and everybody's trying to recreate it. Um, I love that you sat down and organized this. I, I want to offer to help, but I know I'm overcommitted <laughs> personally. And I will, I will uh, you ping me for whatever you think I, I can do to help, but I can't commit to being the guy on the ground helping oh, I know, I know, I know. people. I, I desire to, 
because that is how you get people to to change is you you work with them one on one and you have the answers because you've done the hard work of doing the research that's how you get people to buy an electric vehicle or or you know add a heat pump or, or make these transitions these good decisions um, this is this is I'm glad that mass energize you've really created that business there um, it in Without that, I think I wouldn't have any buy-in on this idea because of follow-through. But because you have that business, because you're talking about kind of a public-private par partnership where you've got people who are doing this as a job, uh, as well as having support from committees and volunteers, I think this could work. But man, it's a lot of a lot of work. Yeah. Um, and the the priority is. To be able to handle the first customer is where the heavy lifting is. Once you've got that, you can keep working with more customers on those same topics and be able to, to do things more easily. But that first lift is very hard. Yeah, no doubt about it. Let me know um, what you need. <laughs> when, I, when I looked at this with and I put together a, a small proposal outline that was similar to this, but it was, it was, and I'm willing to share it if it was, if there's any practical benefit to it. But the idea of it was very similar in terms of what the short-term focus uh, of what CSEC could do in the next six months or a year. So, um, I feel that what Brian's, I mean, what Brad's been working on is a bigger scope thing than just the CSEC committee itself. And um, what I had proposed was something that was more to do with working with that assessor's database and then being able to plan um, ways of communicating with the audience that were was derived from the the database and um develop a way of communicating what we've been trying to to suggest you know these heating improvements or the things like that, we need to have a, a, a way of communicating to that audience um, things that will make a difference. And I think just to get, one of the things that I did was I looked at the database data that um, Brad has an extract that is from the assessor's database. And um, I looked at it and one of the things that I could see was the breakdown of the different fuel types and the kind of heating systems that they have and what the quantities of those are across the town. And um, some decision will have to be made about how to do outreach to these different groups of people. What I think could be being done in the next two or three months is ways of identifying and cataloging um, the different groups of people that are in this database, and then also developing the, the outreach programs that would be necessary to get to that first touch, you know, the, the first like what you were saying, Brian, where you're reaching people for the first time. Even if we had a program in mind, how soon would we, having a, a, a rough schedule for when things might or might not happen struck me as being really important. At the very least, I think that there's, um, 
There's a need, you know, when I, when I was talking to Brad today, we were talking about a plan schedule that could be formulated. And some of the things that would have to happen probably that would be in a schedule were a plan development where we specify the database use and what the requirement documents would be for what we wanted to do. And then have a high level uh, plan where part of the problem that Brad has expressed to me is that we don't yet have buy-in for this plan from the town government, you know, and um, we need to establish it better so that we, the plan that he was referring to with the flow diagrams and stuff be iterated more so that, I, I, I mean, clarified more so that um, it's, it's an acceptable program that people have agreed to, to say, let's move forward with this. Then we also need to get our a buy-in about what we're trying to do just from our own committee so that the various members feel like it's something that is worth working on in a collective fashion. And then the outreach development that would be needed to reach, let's say we identified 2,500 people from the database, the assessor's database that needed to be contacted for various reasons. What would we be contacting them with and for and what type of timetable would that happen in? And then approximately when could we imagine starting an outreach program to them? What, what would people even imagine? Would it be this winter? Would it be next spring? Would it be next summer? How do other people feel about, about what I'm saying? Uh, really quickly what my draft document looked like and it, 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 can you see that um, can you see this yeah it was just this is a smaller project than Brad's, but it, it it's essentially it has the same pieces in it in terms of what we were trying to do. To me, it seemed like more to, to get CSEC to work on a project like this. First thing was to create a fossil fuel fired homes list of the homes in Concord in these different categories of oil, electric resistance, and natural gas. And when I looked at the database, I, I can see how it's broken apart. They have it in terms of some of the categories are coal or wood, electric, gas, solar assisted. And then they break it apart where it, it has to do with whether they're central heating, half central, heat pump, or none or have an air conditioner type of unit in the, in the mix. And then we were able to get quantities of each one of those. Let me just show you quickly. This is a, a table that I generated from the assessor's database extract that shows the type of heating system that people have and the type of the description of, you know, whether it's central or. Yeah. So it shows a total of 55, 5,544 systems in the Concord database as a residential. And for example, in the ones that use gas, it's 29.55, and the ones that use electric, is 
206 that are. Yeah. Those are mostly uh, electric thermal storage, maybe, or some. Or some electric things. resistance, I guess. Um, and an increasing number of heat pumps, I guess. Um, right. But the database is uh, really quite inaccurate uh, because it doesn't necessarily know whether heat pumps were used. Um, if you add a heat pump, it doesn't really know, knows nothing about whether that's doing much of the heating or not. So it's, um, that's one of the, the interesting challenges. If yeah. I go back to this diagram, like one of the things that it shows is it has heat pump as, as a form. It shows people that are gas customers that are using a heat, heat pump. And it also shows electric customers that are using a heat pump. But it's unclear as to what that means. Right. So. I, I don't want to be practical for us to contact these people and interview them and ask them um, what the breakdown of their heat is and whether they'd be willing to share their their bills and whether you know we can go from that and improve the efficiency of their houses. Yeah, I think so. The, uh, the data assessors database is so rich with information, uh, which is kind of it's kind of fun uh, to go through it, but uh, I think it's it's a good source and it's publicly available. We can use it for what we want as long as we're respectful of uh, of homeowners. I believe um, solar um, assisted. There's a hmm. there's one a solar assisted. I don't know what that means. It just happened to show up in the database. Um, It would imply that the total number of electric resistance customers in the database is only 206. Uh, well, that's not electric resistance. 55. Pardon? That's not electric resistance. That includes, uh, of course, heat pumps. Um, All these types. Janet's house is in that list. Yeah, my house is totally heat pump and nothing else. And then you can see the, here are the oil customers that have central, half central heat pump or none. And you, the quantities there. That's probably the biggest audience of the people that, because there's 207 electric customers is, is not that many. Yeah, I, th I think we should start with, um, I don't know. <laughs> I was going to say we start with oil, but then I think, well, maybe we should start with electric because electric resistance heating is so right. expensive. And um, I don't know how many places do. I think the Staffordshire Lane condos use electric resistance, but I don't know if you have a condominium, how easy it is to switch over to, um, to a heat pump. With the single family houses have resistance heat, I don't know. One of the things that would happen no matter what we do to use this data from the database is to develop a plan for the intended use of the data. How would we do the outreach to these families? And can we work with CMLP to add supplemental information maybe into their billing statements? Is that something that is even conceivable? It was, that was talked about the other day well, CMLP regularly puts out um, flyers with their bills. So, um, what I mean is, sure that, that they could get, they would be willing to put something out. If we had a program going, is that some, a, a vehicle that we would entertain possibly as a way of reaching that audience? Or what, what would we want to do? Direct mail? Or would we want to? I want a handwritten and addressed direct mail with your name on it that uh, looks like it comes from somebody in the town of Concord that can help you out. And then you might open it and read it. If you put, if you, if you 
if you wanted to rely on, on bill inserts, of course, some people are getting their bills online. They don't read the inserts. Uh, even, a, you know, it's hard to get people's attention. Uh, anyway, um, defining that is part of the challenge. And um, we okay, just, where are we? If this program really was uh, ready for for people, residents to interact with it, um, I'd be walking around my neighborhood, you know, talking to my neighbors and saying, here, here's a flyer, go follow up, um, you know, I can't tell you how many people in my neighborhood, uh, when I talk to them and answer questions about, you know, home projects like changing a hot water heater or getting a car, they're so thrilled to talk to somebody who doesn't have um, a, a bias, a financial bias, and actually is knowledgeable. Um, that interaction is very valuable. You know, it's great to do bill inserts and things, and I'm not saying do the, don't do those things. Um, but literally a door knocking campaign, knock on the doors of those homes we know heat with oil and try to talk to them face to face. It's like, you know, the vacuum salesman kind of pitch. I mean, if you're talking about a thousand places, I mean, that's not that many really, or some direct, even, even 2,500 is perhaps doable over a period of a couple of years. And we'll get some, get some hats that say, ask me about my heat pump. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can also, I mean, do as you do with political canvassing. You, you have uh, little things that, you know, hang on, a, on the doorknob um, to say, you know, this is the program that this town committee is doing. And uh, if you want more information, we'd love to help you. I mean, whatever it says. But uh, in, so, uh, a lot, I mean, you go on door to door, there's a lot of people who don't answer. But if you leave some information, maybe they will look at it. Uh, but the, the hard work happens in preparing for the first person. That's really what has to be focused on because the campaign stuff is always fun. Committees always love doing a campaign when they have something to sell, but we have to make the product first. We have to really educate ourselves, have all this stuff documented, be ready to really deal with the first person. So that's, that's uh, I'm, I'll get excited when we're there and we're starting to do the campaign because we've done the other work. That's, mm -hmm. that's the hard part. Mm -hmm. right. Sorry, I know, you get back to your meeting. Gilda. Uh, Gilda has something. Well, it's it's, it's just in the name, in the name of time, it's almost 530. Um, and there needs to be a point in the meeting where we have some public room okay. for some public comment. Gilda is waiting. That's why I was, I was raising my hand. So, um, so I'm Gilda. I, I was on CSEC for three years at, and with some of you, it was fun. And uh, I guess and now I'm in Mothers Out Front. And um, the reason that I'm here is because um, I absolutely agree that uh, we have to figure this out. We have to get 50% of homeowners um, to, to electrify. That, those, that might not be the exact number, but we have to do it or we're not gonna meet our goals, our emission goals. And I um, I do not think that it it should be all up to CSEC. I think there are, that CMLP and um, Mothers Out Front and other organizations can help. I really, really like the idea of having a, a, a five-year plan so that it's not a bunch of one-offs like we've been doing we've learned a lot from those one-offs we we know we've learned a lot from from various campaigns that we've run but um now but you know we've only moved a few percent and we have to move a lot more so um and so i you know i'm really interested in this i i came to the meeting because um i think it's a it's a very good direction. And um, I was wondering what the rest of CSEC thought. Can you repeat what you said? Because I cut off and I missed it. 
what you're saying? Um, basically, that um, I think it's a great it's a great program. It's a, it's essential that we figure out how to move to electrify our homes. That our current um, our efforts to date have only moved a few percentage, and we need we need. 50% and that CSEC doesn't, shouldn't be expected or shouldn't feel like you have to do it all by yourself. That, it, that it's, um, it, you, CMLP paid staff will play, needs to play a big part in this and, um, and that there are other organizations. I'm with Mothers Out Front. We're interested in this. I mean, we need, more specifics the way you guys do. But um, I think it would be so exciting for us to be able to figure out how to attract large numbers. Um, so thank you. Well, I think it'd be great if CSEC and Mothers Out Front could work together and figure things out. I, I wanted to mention that a lot of this doesn't come out of thin air, a little bit of thin air, but uh, you know there are aspects of this that are based on what's been done in, in a couple of Colorado communities, including uh, Fort Collins, which is trying to design a kind of a one-stop approach to, you know, we're gonna come and tell you what your house could use. Um, and, um, also, uh, stuff that's happening up in Vermont. Uh, I, I saw a webinar on, um, what was it called? It was really cool. Uh, it was called Vermont. Um, hmm, I lost it. Uh, but it was, uh, no, it was called Vermont Zero Energy Now Program. Uh, and, but we want to find something that works for us that would uh, could use the right amount of volunteer resources that we have and also uh, paid resources. But it's, and if we, if we were successful, we would be ahead of most Massachusetts communities. I don't know of any communities that are, that are, that are kind of doing things at this level yet, but Kate might. It's just been challenging for me to, sort of think through where we're going, you know, in terms of what we want to collectively do as a committee group this winter. And um, I guess the only thing that I can think that we can do is to continue down this path and do our best to brainstorm what we're actually going to do. Um, yeah. Every time we have a meeting, we represent a lot of updates too of other things that are going on in the community uh, that are sort of paralleling what we're trying to do. And I think there's a lot of merit in that because from that, sometimes there's more fruit as to what we can do too. So I think what you're, what Doug's trying to say is we don't, we don't have a lot of action items for the various members of the committee to take away from this meeting and say, okay, I want to go work on this box and uh, uh, see what I can come up with. I don't know, is that a little bit of it? Yeah, I mean, uh, here's another, here's an example of a thing, like we haven't addressed it all, but it's just, just, just an example. The people over at Newbury Court are still interested in getting their LEDs uh, put in and they are interested in getting consultation for what a, a larger commercial building could have done to it to meet more better energy standards. We haven't been able to address things like that at all. And yet I believe giving people hope um, that's just one example, but I come across situations where there is a need to address it, but there's a lack of ability to kind of have a coherent 
pattern strategy that allows us to, to engage with it. And I don't know if other people feel that way, but it is a little, the, the solutions to a lot of the things that we have are so multifaceted in terms of the different ways that they have to be considered and acted on. It makes it very challenging, I think. Well, it's 5.35 and we're past the adjournment time. Uh, I'd like to make, uh, does anybody have any other questions or business that they want to bring forward before we adjourn? Hearing none, somebody want to make a motion to adjourn? I will make a motion to adjourn. All those in favor? Uh, I'll second. Oh, yeah, that's important. We can't adjourn. It wasn't seconded. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all. Goodbye, everybody. Um, we I, take a vote. <laughs> we'll do the best we can in the December meeting. I, I just think we're going to carry this forward and see where it goes, I guess. Yeah. I'm going to reach out to people and try to get ideas on on different parts and stuff um, and um, see what we get to. Um, Brad, do you mind sending me that document? I You may have in the past, but I don't know if I have it. I don't think I did. OK. One of the things that I did is I put, um, if anybody has any interest in looking at the data that from the extracts. There are three extracts that are in the active projects area under Concord Heats Electric, a project called, it's called the Concord Heats Electric Project. And in there are the extracts that are just um, Brad forwarded them to me today. And um, they can be opened as Excel files. And you can see that what what the kind of numbers are that scrutinize. I was hoping that I might be able to work with um, Heine a, a little bit, Haney a little bit, a bit with it to understand the data and what we can use it for better and have a way to actually work with it. The best thing I've been able to do is that this afternoon I quickly put together a pivot table that allows us to see the quantities and numbers of all the categories that are in the data. Was there a motion to adjourn already? Yeah, there was a motion yes. to adjourn. I don't think you can keep talking. But I don't think anybody posted on it. <laughs> yeah. That's a non-debatable motion. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, why don't we adjourn? And uh, we'll be talking. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Okay, we have Bye. order to adjourn. <laughs>